Hi, I'm Pastor Brandon Briscoe, and welcome to another episode of The Postscript, Living Faith Bible Institute's weekly podcast and YouTube series devoted to having conversations with pastors and professors from Living Faith Bible Institute, as well as the Living Faith Fellowship, having conversations about ministry and about theology, what the Bible says about the Great Commission and what God's called us to do in this world. And so, in our last conversation last week, we were with Pastor Brian Hedges, and we we're having a conversation about Word First Publishing, which is a ministry out of Harrisonville, Missouri, and his church, Heartland Bible Fellowship, uh, that is devoted to printing God's word and making sure it gets to where it needs to go. This is really, this is a work of our fellowship. It's a collaborative effort uh, to help have these Bibles produced and to send, and sent wherever they need to go, to missionaries, uh, to ministries all over the U.S., all over the world. And so today we're going to continue our conversation, but we're going to be talking about the relationship between the translation of God's word into different languages and uh, that effort alongside the Great Commission and the transmission of the gospel all over the world. And so as we get started today, I want to start by introducing our guest, Pastor Brian Hedges. Welcome back to The Postscript. That's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. We're glad to have you. So I want to start by um, reading some statistics that kind of express the heartbeat of our conversation and 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 the idea that kind of will drive our dialogue today. So the first one I want to read is more than 650 languages have the completed uh, translated Bible in in their language, which Mm -hmm. is great news. A lot of hard work and uh, devotion for many believers over a long period of time went into making sure uh, that we had 650 um, translations of God's word. Mm -hmm. But there are 7,000 languages in existence today. And so, so there are many left, and many languages left undone. Yeah, at least 1.5 billion people do not have the full Bible in their first language. More than 110 million do not have a single verse of Scripture, um, which is a, is a heartbreaking and and kind of staggering uh, thought. Approximately 1,600 languages still need a Bible translation project to begin just to begin just to start so here's my very first question for you uh, why do we need to translate the Bible I think that there's there's mm-hmm. differing views on this uh, from our ilk from you know from you know from our background of belief mm-hmm. um, why do we need translations and and why is it so important to the transmission of God's word yeah and that's a really great question because uh, there's some in our uh, I don't know. If, I don't really know. Who just I'm not speaking for those in our fellowship, but there's some who uh, would think that the Lord cannot return until this project is accomplished. Hmm. And and of course, we would say no. That's obviously not uh, a good hermeneutic. The right. Lord can return at any moment. So that's not really what's driving the trans the, the translation process. Mm-hmm. It really is the issue of transmitting yeah. God's message, His Word, uh, to target cultures in their heart language. And we do that regardless of of, uh, of a Bible translation. We do that through human instrumentation, mm. and God has always chosen that you know mode to con- communicate the Word of God. So, really, the the preservation then of Scripture is what we're talking about. Yeah. And so, how is God getting His Word into that language, into that that people group? Right. Um, you know, some would say, well. And this can become quite a quite a gnarly discussion. So, uh, but some would say, well, you know, so everyone should learn English. Mm-hmm. And and or English is available to everyone because we have God's word preserved in the King James. Yeah, and so if you're gonna if you're gonna study it the way it ought to be studied, uh, the best thing you can do is right. learn English. Right, and then and then a critical text scholar would tell us, well, no, the best thing you could do is learn Greek and Hebrew mm-hmm. and Latin. Right. Yeah, so it's two ends of the spectrum. Yeah, there. two ends of that of that spectrum. And the reality, though, the real nuts and bolts is that that when our job, we all know, the Bible believers' job is to to get the gospel where it needs to go on time. Right. And we're preaching the gospel. And so really, uh, I believe among our uh, circle and our fellowship at churches, oftentimes translation is a product of the mission itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, just as in Acts chapter two, the Great Commission, uh, they didn't start off saying, hey, uh, let's do a Bible translation project. Right. They start off preaching the word of God. Right. And, and they heard, every man heard in his own language. Because you know, ever since the Tower of Babel, 
language has been an, an obstacle yeah. in, in the Old Testament of God's mercy to keep man from destroying himself. But in, in, in this age, of course, to get the message where it needs to go, God reversed that curse so they could hear the word of God. Yeah. So there's a deep, uh, you know, there's a, a, a deep need in every man's heart to, to hear the word of God. And of course, I do believe as a people group receives the word of God in their heart and that, that spiritual work is done, then God, you know, obviously, earnestly, I don't think we even have to pray about it. We intuitively know, just like a baby needs milk, that that people group, those new saints, they need the word of God yeah. and they need the milk of the word of yeah. God. So it behooves us, of course, to, uh, and I say us, meaning uh, a missionary uh, on the ground to, you know, do everything in their power. Uh, to get the word in their heart language so they can understand not just information about God, but it's really at the core understanding God and yeah. who he is. And so this this burden, I think, is born oftentimes out of mission uh, and the transmission then comes uh, and forms into this this process where we end up translating the sure, word of God sure. once it's received in a, in a heart language. So what I'm hearing you say is that we go, we preach the gospel, we know that's the mission. Mm -hmm. We know that's the mission. There's no qualms about that. Our job is to go and to preach the gospel yeah. to every people group. Uh, there are verbal uh, hurdles to that. Mm -hmm. We know that. Um, we employ translators all the time when we go on mission trips because there are hurdles along the way. But th the point is, is this. Once you have reached a people group with the gospel, you know, it's time to disciple them. And uh, we can see in in even in the English history that uh, that Christians without Bibles is problematic, right? Like Absolutely. if you don't have a, a Bible available to you uh, in in your language, it becomes problematic to the process of discipleship. And so, really, this is the, this is kind of at the core of the question: is mm -hmm. uh, translation is a byproduct of the need to disciple and grow mature right. believers all over the world. Right, and this is happening. This isn't something that we're talking about in theory. Uh, right now, uh, in our fellowship, we're affiliated with uh, Palira Chabwana mm -hmm. or Andrew Ong mm -hmm. uh, or others I could na name right now, and they're in situations where to to teach the Word of God like they would like to teach, uh, even if there is already a translation. Mm -hmm. We'll it, get to that. Uh, yeah, it, they, they need to do some translation work. Someone needs to do mm -hmm. some translation work to fully communicate uh, the information that will make the best disciples. Yeah. So let's get to the, the testimony of Pastor Palira and his situation mm -hmm. and use that as an example maybe of what we're talking about. Can you explain what it is that the need is in Malawi in the Chichewan language? I, I, I can. I know uh, from, well, I personally, let me back up. I haven't been the, to uh, Malawi myself or right. studied the Tichewan language. But from what I understand uh, from the testimony of Pastor Mark Trotter and, and Palira Chibwana, some of the basic verses that we might take for granted uh, are missing. So, if, for instance, if you're teaching the, on the Godhead in their current Bible, in their current in yeah. their current Chechewan Bible, yeah, and which is uh, which is the language, the primary heart language of mm -hmm. many of the people. It doesn't mean they they can't speak another language, sure. obviously, but it is their primary tribal language and tongue. Uh, they're gonna they're gonna be lacking in some areas, uh, you know, of doctrine that we might teach. Uh, Perhaps for you know First John chapter five and regarding the, the Trinity or mm -hmm. uh, you know Acts you know we there's you know all the standard verses that we might sure. look at uh, that have a critical text slant to them we're going to yeah. be missing or gone uh, in some cases <clears throat> they're not they're just it's it's worse than what we know uh, not necessarily in the Chichewa mm -hmm. but I know in like the Arisan Bible uh, mm -hmm. if, if we, uh, Arisa India yeah in yeah. Arisa India there are complete portions of Scripture. That I I don't know why they're not there. I, it may not have be a, anything to do with the translation, and maybe they didn't know how to get it there. I don't know, but it's right. just it's just not apples to apples. And we're not talking about issues of of culture. Even we're just talking about having the completed word of God yeah. in the in various languages. So it, in regard to the the Tichewan project, so oh, it it behooves. I know Pastor Pallier is very excited to receive an updated, um, you know copy of the word of god um it's coming from a tr based translation texas receptus for those that aren't familiar with mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. and uh you know why didn't they come straight from the king james bible you know we can debate all of that i'm I, the reality is is they're, they're going to be as close as as they can be uh and it's a process yeah we all understand i hope we all understand that it is a process yeah. uh, not even the king james gang thought that they delivered the perfect word of god sure. at that time so uh, we're just praying that in this process, what they get is better, 
than what they've had. Yeah. And I know Pastor Palira and the, the priesthood of believers that are Chichewa speakers will prove that out yeah. uh, for good or bad. And and then we will make any necessary or somebody will make necessary adjustments. Right. And uh, with Word First, we'll be happy to, to, to print that, to print and get it. Those variations. <laughs> very, very much. We'd be happy to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, I mean, that's, first of all, that's a beautiful testimony of the relationship between the living faith churches mm -hmm. to make sure that a people group that we minister to in varying degrees, varying levels, um, we're very aware of Pastor Palira and the Passion Center for Christ. And that work is an, is an integral part of, of the fellowship. Yes. Um, and we love them and we pray for them. And then here's an opportunity for us to minister to them and make sure that core doctrines that we know are in our King James Bible right. uh, are also a part of the core doctrine of what is being discipled into the growing believers there. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and we count that a, an important work. Yes. But there are hurdles, right? And so yeah. you mentioned, you know, uh, in our world today, I think especially among maybe Baptists who, who, who think and, and see God's word, the King James, uh, and hold it with high regard, there is this tendency to, um, you know, the translation work is such a hotbed of critical text people. Mm -hmm. And so if, when we start talking about translation, it's muddled by the fact that, that in our world today, a lot of the people doing the translation work are coming from a, a critical text background and they're not using the TR and they're not referencing the King James. And uh, they are using what we would see to be a tainted group of texts uh, to do their translating. And that, and that kind of affects the way we see the work of translation today. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could speak to that just a little bit. It really, it really does. Um, of course, uh, we're never going to get any footing among the uh, critical text crowd for mm -hmm. credibility. And so we have to decide really what, who are we trying to please here? And right. that's the Lord. We're trying mm -hmm. to get the, the best word we can. Uh, there are, you know, obviously we understand why we have concerns with the Vaticanus and the, and the, and the Sinaiticus and all mm -hmm. of those issues. And so that's another podcast, but right. uh, the reality of, of, of the, you know, nuts and bolts of getting the word in that language and becomes quite a problem. Mm -hmm. If you are dependent upon um, a translation group that really doesn't value uh, a faithful word or a faith based, mm -hmm. as we would call it, uh, a faith based position right. of the word of God. And at the end of the day, we know that scholarship is going to rule. Now, and the, it's a process. So I do want to be careful um, not to take anybody's Bible out of their hand. Right. In any language, yeah, because um, you know, a, a little dirt in the water is better than no water at all. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. and so we are talking about a purification process. Yeah, and so long before the letter comes the spirit, and so I, I have to believe that many many translators that have gone forth, regardless of their view of critical text or not, have, have in the in, had the right spirit. I, I'd have to believe that. Yeah, I don't know if it's true, but I pray that it is, and I yeah. think it is. I think so too. I think so. I really do. So I, I, we need to be fair. Because right. they've done the, a lot of hard work, as you pointed out earlier. In any any translation, it's a lot of hard work. Yes. You know, and we also believe in a process. So God's able to take somebody and, and bring his word into that language. So mm -hmm. if their heart's right, I do believe God will use that. And and God wants people to get the word more than we do. Yeah. And so so I think that's a, an attitude that we got to be careful with, you know. Uh, but when it comes right down to us now being in a position on the ground where we're responsible, where we're responsible right. and we're delivering well we do want to deliver a cup of, of clean water if at all possible mm -hmm. and we want to do the best job that we can so so who's translating the bible in our group and uh, uh it's small group yeah but there's many that probably could and it may be something that um that some of the young folks in LFBI and, and in our churches and our fellowship is it something that we need to pray about and not mm -hmm. leave it uh, to some other group. Right. And and we need to be asking the Lord to, to, to provide those linguists because we have real projects. We have real things that uh, are going on. Yeah. And so right now we trust other agencies and praise the Lord for agencies like the Trinitarian Bible Society. Maybe they work with them or maybe they work apart from them, but there, there needs to be, uh, continue to be people that are committed uh, to a faithful word in whatever language is being translated into. Yeah. I think it's, um, it's also important to note that just because a translation comes from a King James Bible or a uh, Texas Receptus, you know, background Masoretic text and mm -hmm. Greek New Testament doesn't mean it's a good translation. So 
um, when you get into this subject of translation, it's just not as 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 cut and dry as people like. There's to make a lot it of variables. Yeah, there there's really a are. lot of variables, and so I think that that the next question is is fitting then. So what should our rules of engagement be? So if, if we as a fellowship, and, and if you don't mind speaking on our behalf, uh, it might be different, it might vary from church to church, but sure. as a whole, if we were to participate in this, uh, what would our rules of engagement be uh, from our philosophical doctrinal background? How would we approach this? Yeah, I think that's that's a, <clears throat> I don't know if I should be the one to speak on this. Well, but, you're on the show. So. But I'm on the show, yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to say what, what's on my mind. So yeah. my heart in that would be, I think, because uh, we do understand God's mission. Mm-hmm. I think it is going to be based much more in a journeyman, uh, workman mindset than a scholastic mindset. Mm-hmm. It's going to be based on a people group receiving the word of God. I think that's where we got to start. Yeah. Uh, we're not on a we're not on a mission to correct all critical text all you know seven hundred and six hundred and fifty critical text Bibles in the world or what right. have you. It's daunting, but it's also just not <laughs> yeah, what we're called to do. Praise God. Just just yeah. do what they're just do what you've got. You know, we use yeah. it. And uh I think what what it would be based in then is real again, real battles, real situations like we have with Pastor Polera or others where we are in a situation where the disciples are yearning for truth. Yeah, I think yeah. that's going to probably precipitate most of our translation work uh, or or an overwhelming understanding that this people group who has now received the gospel and desires to be discipled is not going to get the traction they need without getting this Bible in their heart language. Right. You know, uh, and then I think that would precipitate, the need would precipitate, uh, you know, the action that we would want to take to to get it there. Mm-hmm. And so if there was someone out there saying, hey, I'm a, lingui- uh, I'm a linguist, you know, well, before you pray about the specific field, maybe you just need to pray about yielding yourself to God and then ask God, where's the next missionary or where's the next uh, area that needs to be translated? Yeah. I would make a case that not all <clears throat> translation uh, needs to happen necessarily among um, you know, people, indigenous people that haven't even had a word. Uh, perhaps if there were two billion people in a continent somewhere that had a, a word that was, could, needs to be improved in that church, it was looking for it. Uh, mm-hmm. Perhaps that's a project worthy yeah. of, of investment. God would have to arrange that. And I think then the people in our local churches on a more practical level. So if you're a young man or a young woman out there going, I, I want to get involved. Yeah. First of all, technology allows us to get involved today. Sure. You can be a checker. You can be involved in this. But how do we get started? We'll start with getting saved, getting discipled, uh, getting involved in LFBI or your local Bible Institute, getting trained up under your local church, getting involved in missions, taking missions trips, do everything that you need to do to be equipped mm-hmm. as a disciple yourself. Because unless we understand the theological moorings of the word of god ourselves having a a background in linguistics isn't really all that we need sure that's like saying well i've got you know i've got a a degree in teaching let me teach the bible right right like that that's not how it works we got to begin with a theological position and we have to share a heartbeat with christ you know and through his spirit and through his word and then from that well, we'll teach you the skills we can, you know, you can, there's places where you can learn the skills necessary to do the work, but if your theology mm-hmm. isn't right, um, well, there's no way your translation is going to be right. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's huge. Yeah. And, um, and so it's, it's by God, I mean, God can preserve his word and he does it, he'll mm-hmm. use the vessels, but I think in our, it wouldn't, we wouldn't be good stewards of, of our time, talent, treasure, if we don't invest ourselves in understanding the word of God that we are going to translate because inevitably, as much as we hate the the term dynamic equivalence and things yeah. like that, there are going to be cases for a translator uh, where he's going to come across calls. And uh, if if the text doesn't clearly make it in, into that new language, there's nothing in the Greek, the Hebrew, the English that can make that call for him. Theology is all they've got. Yeah, in prayer. that's right. God help. Okay, so that, that, what you just said was jam packed. So you, you use the term dynamic equivalency, which I think a lot of people in our fellowship who are who take a faith based p- position understand dynamic equivalency is not ideal. Absolutely. Right? Uh, so maybe you walk us through what you just said and yeah. better explain it for I'll the give you a real example. Not, okay. I have a, I won't say where or what, but I have a friend translating into a, a dialect that's never been written. So mm-hmm. he's creating. The, the the language he's creating the alphabet so there's no written language currently correct. in that people group correct okay. so he has created the, the the syntax and is now translating um and so uh which is amazing in itself yeah so that's talk about hard some to fathom more. yeah these and these guys are on a different level intellectually for sure than, than this guy mm-hmm. but um 
but he ran across a real example that he was talking about is in the in the particular language that he was translating in uh, when the men bring the the lame man to Jesus and they put the hole in the roof and drop drop okay so in the English uh, I forget I actually I don't have the reference in front of me but it, it doesn't tell us how many men mm-hmm. doesn't say um, but in the particular dialect that he's translating in in the, when they there the they brought the man the they in that particular dialect they have a they have a, a, a nuance is it one they is it two they is it three they or is it four they and so here the translator is going i don't know i can look it up in the king james and i don't know i can look it up in the greek and i don't know i can look it up in the and i don't know there's hmm. no indication in any language that i'm aware of if it's a one they two or a two they three they four they or five they up to five and it's wow. all it's all you know he's got to make a decision who is it two to five or more right? right and so and i don't know where that ended up and i i'm, I'm gonna just pray for him to make a good decision sure and, sure and he would never say whatever i come up with is the absolute final yeah. you know if god wants to change it let him do so mm-hmm. so you understand that yeah. that would be an example of of a true translate that's a real life scenario where a translator is praying earnestly saying oh god help me i don't know what to say here yeah i don't know what word to put here right and uh, and that's where we have to trust the the process of preservation. Yeah, it is a faith based translation process too. Mm-hmm. And and there's so there's a lot of complexity. There's a lot of nuance. It's not clean. It's dirty. It's gritty. It's pioneer work. Absolutely. Uh, but the but as we've said before, the mission at some point it begins to demand that. So like we take for granted the fact that we can pick up our Bible and we can study it in our language and we can believe that this is the authority of God's word for my life. We take that for granted. We neglect it all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but in a place where someone has just heard that that God himself came to earth, died for them, rose again to forgive them of their sins, that their entire eternity is impacted by that reality and that he happened to write a letter. Well, uh, who wouldn't want that letter? Absolutely. And, uh, and I think at some point, you know, uh, we've got to ask ourselves, what is our involvement in ensuring uh, that not only the word of God is being preached and spoken, or even that we're teaching people English to study it in the King James, a valid thing to do Mm -hmm. uh, is to educate people how to read the King James and to speak English. And that has many benefits to it, Mm -hmm. but also, you know, uh, how, how are we going to provide people with something that they can take home and they can study with themselves in in their heart language? Um, then, you know, another question that I have for you is, um, literacy, Mm -hmm. um, and, and the significance of literacy in the world. Um, mm-hmm. do you, is this something that you think about? And, and what, what role do we have in, in teaching people to read? Yeah. Well, it's amazing uh, what role we have because what, and I, this is going to tap into a little bit of Baptist history. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't think a lot of us are really have thought about this or are right. privy to it, just really how much the world has changed in the last 200 years mm-hmm. uh, and how Baptist missions have changed the world. Baptists, and especially among independent Baptists in this country, have really done quite a work coming out of the Philadelphian church age. Mm. And issues of literacy are part of that work. Um, and so in the 60s, when when the, this Bible publishing thing was happening and, and, and these statistics were being understood and uh, local churches were mobilizing to get the word where it needed to go, and praise God for that, and they're still doing that. Uh, the literacy rate was was a much lower, and so you're delivering a Bible to cultures that don't oftentimes don't even have ability to read it. Right. But today, the literacy rate is is almost it's in the 90s. 90 percent of the world is literate. Whoa. And so, um, so the literacy rate is much higher. So, in some ways, that makes the translation work even more you can you know mm-hmm. uh, you can there's understand. a greater need then. greater need because there's, because more, there's more literacy yeah right and so you know people might say well why do we need to you know print the printed word let's just do it digitally i say whatever yeah yeah both it that, doesn't matter to me that's a silly thing to get caught up in I, uh, <laughs> economics is a bigger question there is, yeah. is whether you yeah. know maybe 90 percent of the people in the world can read but not 90 percent of the, the people in the world can afford a tablet right 
you know, or a computer. Right. right. And it's still valid to send out the audio Bibles and all of that as well, because mm-hmm. there's yeah. still people that can't read, and there's a lot of them in remote places. but Or don't have their language. There's a lot of dialects that still don't have the language that are written. Written. They, yeah. they can understand it audibly, yeah. but they don't have a written. Right. So to be literate, you're, you're often not uh, literate in your own heart language. So mm-hmm. that's a whole other issue when you look at the, the amount of languages that we're talking about. So uh, the tension there is important. I think I think to kind of back up a little bit, back to your original question, then how do you even process this? You right. know, I think is to get is look at the Word of God scripturally. You, you see that when God is moving among a people group, He gives them His Word. You know, mm-hmm. uh, He audibly gave His Word up to Moses, but then Moses got a written word. Yeah. And God was because God was doing a work in a people group. Yeah, uh, and a preserved, a preserved. It word. was a preserved word, perfect word. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and then when He was establishing the church, uh, of course, by the end of the first century, the canon of Scripture, we got it. We're reading it. Yeah, you know, and then we know that in in Revelation chapter nine, or Revelation chapter five, verse nine, it says, "And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, and thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God and." Uh, by the blood out of every kindred, tongue, and people, and nation. So God's end game involves all peoples. Yeah. You know, all tongues and yeah. all nations. And so this this issue of getting the word of God there is really important. And um and so we see that that in history it has been Baptist. And the first work of the pioneer, whether it be a Judson or a William Carey, mm-hmm. was to get that Bible translated into that heart language. Yeah. Uh, of the Hindu, of the Burmese, et cetera, et cetera. And that became oftentimes their li- their life work. Yeah. So uh, the Bibles that we have laid our hands on in the Word First ministry that you have, the churches that have participated in assembly, have been the work of Adoniram Judson. Mm. Not, I mean, it's not an updated copy. It's still the work of, of several hundred years ago. Yeah. And we're still sending that word. So it is a it is a – it's an arduous process that that people need to involve themselves that you know God needs to continue to call the pioneer to involve themselves and if they want to get the word in that heart language yeah if they see that God is is working in a people like you've said and they and they and they want to go forward and understanding the word in another language isn't enough mm-hmm. then the work of translation begins it's a transmission then of the word of God in their written language right even if they have to create a language it's a, it's incredible thought yeah. And daunting. Or create an alphabet, I should say. Yeah, it's create a syntax or some <clears throat> sort syntax, to work yes. from. Yeah. Yes. It's it's an, it's an amazing and and challenging thought, especially for a lot of us who maybe have never gotten our imagination around this this work, right? Like I think a lot of us know our responsibility to the transmission of God's word, but a lot of us haven't considered the translation of God's word and 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 the the role, you know, the the facet of the work that that is. Uh, what should people be praying about in terms of um, how to consider this and, and to be a part mm-hmm. of this process? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, and I say young people, but people that are gifted in language, especially, mm-hmm. I think this is one of those things in particular. I think all of us can be a part of the process of getting the word where it needs to go, whether it's preaching, assembling, et cetera. But sure. I think when it comes to translation, um, you know, many are called for your chosen. There are some people that just really – your gifting leads you to that. Mm-hmm. And I think by submitting to the discipleship process in your local church and the leadership of, of the pastor and the folks in your church, you should be praying about getting involved in this. And there are now avenues, uh, you know, where we can encourage education even. Um, mm-hmm. Bearing Precious Seed is going to start a new uh, translation school. Um, and it is, there's other places you can go, uh, but it is just for translating a yeah. faithful word from the TR. So that's that's good. Uh, but it's going to start with just submitting themselves to discipleship and mm-hmm. uh, and then getting the training. There is a need for linguistics training. Um, and unfortunately, the stewards of most linguistics training uh, come from a critical text background. Mm-hmm. So take those next steps very carefully yeah. uh, beyond uh, you know your, your education in the Word of God. When it comes to translation work, I would seek the counsel of your pastor and uh, and try to find an avenue to get the, the tools that you need to translate the Word of God in a language that it needs to be received in. Mm-hmm. So, just in conclusion to the to the whole matter, uh, could you give us a final word? Uh, sure, I'd be happy to do that. Okay, um, you know, you, when you think about a, a monumental effort uh, in the Word of God, you know, the Bible counsels us to uh, count the cost before we go to war. Mm. You know, before you build a house, take inventory. Yeah, And so this is a pioneering type of work. So I would encourage anyone, I don't want to squelch anyone's zeal 
man, if someone is zealous for this, I actually want to encourage them. I want to cheer them on. I want, yeah. to, I want to tell them to go, go, go. But I also would tell them to, to count the cost and to invest uh, you know, themselves in the Word of God, in their local church, in ministry, and and seek the counsel of their pastor, yeah, uh, and and take that leadership and and find the right avenues and directions. And as we commit our works to the Lord, He will establish our thoughts. Mm. And uh, but I would encourage them to fortify themselves in a spiritual way, because if you appeal to history and you look at the price that was paid for a Judson uh, wow. or a Carey, yeah, uh, or any contemporary uh, people that are working on translation, regardless of what their view is of the critical text or the TR, it is an arduous effort and uh, it takes some tenacity. And so I would encourage them to, to uh, continue with the zeal mm-hmm. and add it with wisdom and knowledge and work through the structure of their local church and let the Lord take it from there. Man, perfect. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your wisdom with us on this topic. Uh, it's it's a tough one to talk about, yeah. but I think you did a great job of, of sharing the heartbeat and the simplicity uh, of the call to to translation and and more importantly the transmission of God's word. So, Pastor Brian Hedges, I want to thank you for being with us this week. Well, thank you for having me. It's great. Yeah, of course. And I want to thank you as well for joining us for another episode of the Postscript. If this conversation or any of our other conversations from, from previous episodes are interesting to you and you want to learn more about Living Faith Fellowship or Living Faith Bible Institute, please visit lfbi.org or lffellowship.com. We also want to invite you to subscribe to the YouTube channel or to follow us on any of the major podcast platforms so that you're, you're getting up-to-date weekly uh, installments of our show And you can stay up to date with us as we continue to interview pastors and professors from the Living Faith Bible Institute. Uh, We hope that you have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. Uh, We love you and we thank you for sharing your time with us. Bye. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me.